So we're, we're here to, to talk about the way we've been approaching MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. It's always humbling to talk about that because we're very aware that, um, you know, you know we are, we're not here to say this is the way to do it. We're here to describe the way you've been doing it and the way we've kind of adapted so much that we've learned from our teachers and from other people who have uh, gone before and taught us so much about ways to approach this. And, you know, there are probably people in this room who have their own, a lot of their own experience and um, their own ways of approaching it. So, um, again, we're not claiming or wanting to uh, say that this is the best way to do it. But we have found this approach to be quite successful in our research so far over the last nine years. And um, so this is what we're going to tell you is based basically on our overall experience with PTSD and um, with working with non-ordinary states. But then in particular, now it's, it's uh, just over 100 sessions we've done in our two research studies. So um, we kind of tried to refine our approach according to that experience. And we really want to make this a discussion. You now we, we have quite a bit of material we'd like to present, but also we don't want this to just be a, a lecture. Um, so please stop us and with questions or comments as we go along so we can discuss this and you know, I'm sure we have a lot to learn from, from you, too. So, it, one, one thing in the beginning, we want to kind of adjust what we do according to what's of most interest to you. So, we'd like to get an idea of, a, of the background of people who are, here, who are here. First, is there anybody who's been to this workshop before? Well, thanks for showing up again. <laughs> So, you know, that's certainly, <coughs> certainly some of the, a lot of the slides are going to be repetitive. We have tried to um, update, we've updated some things and changed it a bit and changed some of the quotes, but a lot of it's the same, so I hope that it'll be of interest again. Um, how many people are therapists or other kinds of mental health workers, other health professionals, um, a lot, most people. How about uh, people who work with PTSD regularly? Great. So, you know, this will be a great, great chance to get your thoughts based on your experience. Here's the, uh, the outline of what we're planning to do. Um, so in the... Um, First thing this morning is uh, we want to just make sure everybody's up to date on kind of where we are for the search and um, why we are taking this approach and um, just kind of give you some background. But um, is there anybody here that isn't very familiar with our research, the, the studies we've done so far and the results? So, a few people, okay. So, um, we want to make sure we give that background to everybody, but we're, we've condensed it a fair amount, and we'll go through that part pretty quickly, just so you'll, everybody will have the context for um, you know, how we've been using this approach. So, we'll, um, that's the first thing we're going to do, is just kind of go through the rationale that uh, the study we've been doing and briefly give you the results of our study plus the, the study and let you fill you in on what the ongoing studies are. Then we'll have a break at around 10.30 and then after the break we'll, and possibly we'll get to that before the break, but the next thing is we'll, we'll kind of give you an overview of how we see the, our therapeutic method, kind of the basic principles, and then um, lunch at 12 to 1.30. And then after that, we'll talk in more detail about the um, specifics of 
how we approach the kind of three types of sessions. The introductory sessions to prepare people for the MDMA assisted sessions, then the experimental sessions, the MDMA assisted sessions themselves is the second kind of type of uh, session, and then the integration sessions, which we think are a really important, important part of this because um, if you didn't realize this, you probably wouldn't be here, but you know, this is not the usual drug research where we're studying the effects of the drug. This is drug-assisted psychotherapy, which is not something the FDA has a lot of experience with. Um, but we're, that's what we're doing because we're using a, a drug we need to go through the FDA process um, to get to eventually get approval for it and the therapy is, is a very important part of it. My machine doesn't like me to pause too long now. Um, so we'll see, we'll play the elements of those three types of sessions um, and then we'll have another break in the afternoon and then uh, we'll play you the about an hour of condensed uh, audio. We, we've cut out a lot of the silent period, so it's really more like an hour and 45 minutes of the session. But we'll play you that and um, maybe read you some more quotes to give you a little more feel about, about the sessions. Okay, so... Um, just a kind of an overview of where we are now. You know, before we started this, our first study, uh, we got approved by the FDA in 2001 and actually got our DEA and IRB approvals in 2004. So we started that first study in March of 2004. Uh, but before that, um, there have been lots of preclinical studies around the world. The, the good thing about MDMA having such a problematic reputation was that at least a lot of governments had spent a lot of money doing um, preclinical research. Um, and there had been some phase one trials in the U.S. and Europe. So by the time we started, we were able to start at, at uh, phase two, which is an FDA term, meaning the first time you give something, a compound to people with a diagnosis to see if it can be safely used and see if there's an indication that it might have a therapeutic effect. Um, so we finished that study in 2010, then we did a long-term follow-up, and then also um, since then Peter Owen and Raina Widmer from Switzerland finished their study, which was similar to ours. So um, here's what's going on now. Uh, our main uh, thing we're doing now in Charleston is our current study um, with veterans, firefighters, and police officers with PTSD. The first study was mostly people with um, sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse or rape, with only a couple of veterans added at the end. Because when we, when we started the first, when we got permission for the first study, the Iraq War hadn't started yet. And then later we got permission to add veterans, but we only had uh, two veterans um, by the time we finished that study. So now we're focusing on seeing if we can have success with this population. Um, and um, we're also doing a phase one trial. We've gotten permission to give MDMA to therapists who are going to work in uh, clinical trials. Uh, it's, it's, the FDA allowed us to um, do a phase one trial where we do do some psychological measurements, but they allowed us to limit enrollment to people who had completed our non-drug uh, training program. We've got a five-day program that we've worked out using video and discussion in our treatment manual to train therapists that are either working in or preparing to work in uh, MAP-sponsored clinical trials. And then it's an elective thing. They, they're not required to do it, of course, but if they want to have their own MDMA session in the same setting as 
the research with us sitting for them, then they can do that. So we, that's the other thing we do. Yeah. Where, where are you? What university? Um, well, we're uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's not a, the research is not occurring at the university. Oh, okay. Universities are becoming more open to this, it seems, uh, especially now that we have published results in a, a reputable journal that, that seems to have helped. Uh, right now, we don't have any multi-site studies. We're working, you know, the, the answer to the question of where we're going is all of this phase two work, uh, my mic's not working, can you hear me in the back okay now? All right, all of this phase two work is aimed toward, in several years, being able to do phase three trials, which are the similar to phase two, but much bigger. And you need to have two of those in order to apply for FDA approval for it, to make something into a legal medicine. So eventually we, we need to have multi-center trials, but we're not there yet. These, these first three under Charleston, those are the ones we're doing in Charleston at the moment. And then, um, as you can see, there's a, study in Israel, similar to ours, and they actually just had their first MDMA session day before yesterday. Um, so they're underway, and then in Boulder, Colorado, and Vancouver, Canada, um, those studies are all approved and about to start. And they're quite similar. All, all of these vary a little bit in design, but they're all using the same approach that we're going to talk about today. Um, and they're all fairly similar. So we're building a body of phase two data to then meet with FDA and work out what will be the design for the large phase three trials. The Vancouver study just uh, received their MDMA. In the U.S., we haven't had to, to bring any MDMA across the border, so we, we've had a, a legal supply available to Dave Nichols made in 1984. He was over there talking right now. Yeah. And um, in, the, in the other studies, it, it has to be a different standard, so they actually had to get the MDMA from Switzerland for the Vancouver study, and that was a very, very long process. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is, you know, in the first study, it took us an extra three years, basically, because of regulatory delays. But then for the current study, it was much faster. We didn't have that delay. So we're getting a good working relationship with FDA and DEA and our institutional review board, so things are moving much more easily. So I, I hope the same thing will happen in Canada now that that's approved and, um, and Israel. So uh, there's real progress. The other thing is the PTSD relapse study. We had approval to have one more session for the three people that had relapsed in our first study. And so we've and two people, had two people come for that and are going to have a third. This is an open label, um, one session. It's another phase two, just a small proof of concept. To test, you know, in a very small number whether somebody that responded well the first time and then relapsed more than a year later, which in these people was several years later, whether one more session would help them. And so far we've seen that yet I'm going to present that data on Saturday in my talk in the main meeting. So we didn't want to spend too much time on the details here so that we can talk about the method more. Uh, the first study was 20, the one that we completed, and the one we're doing now with veterans and firefighters and police officers is 20 to 24. The others are the one in Switzerland was 12, um, and the ones in Israel and, Denver, and Vancouver are all 12, so they get smaller. The FDA doesn't want you to give something new to too many people in phase two at a time. The idea is test it in smaller numbers, make sure it's safe, and then it shows some signs of helping so that it makes sense, and then go on to phase three. The other is money. You know, MAPS has a, a plan which Amy and Rick will talk about in more detail, but we're trying to use the resources as wisely as we can. Because you don't need huge numbers in phase two. We're, you know, we're not even, you don't even need to reach statistical significance necessarily in phase two. 
we, the fact that we happen to uh, is great, but the, they're not really designed to make sure they're powered to show statistical significance so much as to show s safety in this patient population and a trend toward efficacy. So our strong statistical significance is kind of icing on the cake. It's nice. So this is a good, um, I don't have references on most of these slides um, for this purpose, but Ilsa Jerome, who works for MAPS, um, keeps the, um, our investigative for sure, the literature review up to date, and so that's a great place for references for all the English language literature on MDMA. So, is there anybody that doesn't uh, know a lot about PTSD or have a thorough understanding of PTSD? Okay, so we don't really need to go over this. This is just listing the three symptom groups of PTSD, but I don't want to tell you things you already know. Um, as you also are probably aware, this is a really serious problem and it's growing. You know, the kind of historical um, prevalence has been about 8% in the U.S. population. And of course, it, it's a really growing problem with all the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, probably at least 18%, maybe 30%, um, maybe more have PTSD, but most of the data shows somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. Most of the veterans tell us that everybody's got PTSD, that a lot of people just aren't showing it. I'm sure that's not quite true, but it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, and of course, in, in some parts of the world where there's endemic conflict, um, the rates are much higher. So it's a big problem. Um, and very disabling and um, often lethal. Th these are the new figures that just came out in 2013. Of every day, 22 veterans and one active duty um, military person is committing suicide in the United States alone. Um, and in a study at the San Francisco VA in 2010, they screened everybody that coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they determined that fewer than 10% were getting adequate PTSD treatment by their own reckoning. And you know, there are lots of reasons for that. It's not just that the VA isn't trying. The VA is trying. They're, I don't think they have the resources. And also, um, a lot of veterans are very wary of, of seeking treatment or coming for treatment, too. Yeah, we, you know, our current study is open to veterans from any time, and we've had a few Vietnam veterans come for screening and even sign the informed consent, but then always decide they weren't going to do it, which is understandable. You're talking about the homeostasis they've reached yeah. after living for that long. Yeah, they have, yeah. Yeah, they have and yeah. they have a family that they've lived with or a wife. So these are the three um, kinds of psychotherapy that are in the American Psychiatric Association monograph on treating PTSD, cognitive behavioral, especially prolonged exposure, EMDR, and psychodynamic therapy. And then there's lots of pharmacotherapy. Um, the only drugs approved by the FDA that have an indication for PTSD are sertraline and paroxetine, so on and Paxil, but a lot of other drugs are used, as you're saying, in an attempt to control the symptoms. So, you know, I think anybody that works with people with PTSD would agree we don't have enough good treatments. That's clear. Um, so, you know, these treatments are effective and some are between um, 50 and 75 percent of the time. Most clinicians would probably say it's even less than that. I, I would. Um, so there are other, you know, there are a lot of other interesting approaches. Um, some of which we, I, mean, I guess you would say we incorporate, as you see when we go, as we go on, we incorporate elements of all of these um, in our approaches. So, um, 
it's not that these things don't have anything else, anything valuable to offer. But these are some of the um, interesting other models, uh, internal family systems, voice dialogue and psychosynthesis. Those are ways of working with um, the multiplicity of the psyche, uh, Hakomi therapy, which Annie trained in. Present moment, experience. And a mindfulness based. Mindfulness based. based. And body oriented. And then the sensory motor, other body oriented therapy, therapies. Um, uh, then there are ways, other technologies, and um, other medicines to, that have been used with psychotherapy. Um, holotropic breath work has been a big part of our experience and training. Um, there are interesting virtual realities and technologies being developed. There's decyclosyrian research that, which you know, doesn't change. Uh, it's not not psychoactive in the sense of having a, a different experience uh, in conscious in a state of consciousness. But there's some evidence that may help people with uh, successful exposure there. What is it, Mark? Decyclosyrian. Um, it's a, um, let's see, it was developed for, as a antibiotic, right? It's basically an amino acid. It's like modified amino acid. It just seems to work to, uh, to blunt extinction learning and memory reconsolidation. Yeah, I don't think the mechanism is really understood. Yeah. But it, apparently if you give it, especially maybe half an hour before exposure therapy, the results are better than without it. So it's an interesting line. I think these are all like the virtual reality, the psychosyrian, MDMA. They're all kind of this interesting idea of can we use some technology or drug to augment or catalyze the psychotherapeutic process? Because one thing about PTSD is, um, you know, there hasn't been any evidence, or I don't think most therapists or most psychiatrists or psychologists or other therapists would say that. Um, any drugs like cure PTSD. It's, it's one of the conditions that uh, psychotherapy seems to be particularly useful or necessary. So the idea is can we augment that process? It's kind of what we're doing. Um, and then there's some other things with um, studies with beta blockers and actually morphine. Um, to see if, if that, those are more to see if you can prevent PTSD. Um, so one thing, I, I don't know if some of you have seen the last MAPS bulletin, but I, I wrote a, an article in there about the fact that, you know, what we're doing seems so different from other therapies in some ways, you know, eight hour sessions, um, not exactly the usual format. So it is very different in some ways, but actually, if you look at what happens, many elements of many of these other therapies occur in the MDMA session. So it's what what happens is not you know would not be so strange to any trauma therapist who uses some of these other methods would recognize a lot of things that are thought to be important elements of existing treatments. So, and probably everyone here realizes that too, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to talk about um, the, the old, um, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to say, um, you know, neurocognitive risks of. MDMA does it cause memory problems? Um, there's a lot, there's been a lot of controversy over the years. Um, <coughs> luckily, it, that's been largely laid to rest, and we, I don't think we need to go over that. But just to say that, of course, MDMA has risks, and people have died from taking ecstasy. Uh, not very many, considering how often it's used, but. You know, like any drug, it should be taken seriously. And we don't want to give the impression that it doesn't have risks. But what we're seeing 
where we've gotten to now, I think, is established that it does have a favorable risk-benefit ratio to warrant going on with this research. <coughs> so I'm going to dispense with any other talk about toxicity, except for a little bit about side effects. Um, Michael? Yeah. What are some of the conditions that would be contraindicated? The main contraindication, I think, is um, cardiovascular disease because of, um, you know, it raises blood pressure and pulse. And um, so if you had underlying cardiovascular disease, you could have a stroke or a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing. And then I think there, there are some psychiatric contraindications too. Um, so far we've been excluding people with uh, bipolar type one, um, any kind of active substance abuse that's not in remission for 60 days, uh, eating disorder with active purging because they might have electrolyte imbalances, um, borderline personality disorder, uh, which has to do with the container we have, you know, needing to do it within this confined period of time. I don't think it's about an absolute indication for MDMA probably, but in order to do this research, where we have these real limits on how many sessions, that kind of thing. DID. Um, DID. Or, an exclusion. We have had people with quite a few borderline traits, and we've had people with quite a bit of dissociation, but not reaching the, mm -hmm. the threshold of DID. And again, that's an issue of, we don't, you know, you would probably need a bigger container with much more flexibility than expecting <coughs> people to do it within this <clears throat> kind of demanding research format. And in the bed study, we are allowed to uh, treat people with uh, treated hypertension. They, they go through some extra screening, and we do we watch their blood pressures. But for everyone else, we cover up the blood pressure, and we don't we see it at first for the first two times, and then we cover it up so that it helps with the blinding for our, our session. Yeah. Um, it's generous in terms of the length. I mean, most of the effect is worn off before the eight hours. Um, and sometimes we actually spend more time with people. And they, they spend the night in the office with an attendant on duty afterwards. So part of it is really wanting to give lots of space for, A, making sure they're in a, in a reasonable place afterwards, and B, um, have time to let the process unfold and kind of integrate it, begin to integrate it without too many distractions mm -hmm. or having to deal with, with the outside world. Well, that's, that's a good um, segue into this slide. Um, many people, you know, it, it, we think of it as MDMA magnifies whatever's there. Mm -hmm. So certainly people have affirming and joyful experiences fairly often. But also, especially in people with chronic PTSD, people have many difficult and painful experiences. And so, you know, it's certainly not that people just get blissed out and everything's fine by any means. There's a lot more in, in this population of people, we're seeing a lot more in the way of difficult and painful revisiting of the trauma. So the, the MDMA doesn't usually make it easy. It usually makes it possible in a way that it wasn't before. Yeah, three to five weeks between MDMA sessions. And then we have integration sessions in between. Right. Four, four integrations in between the first <coughs> day, now we're doing three integration sessions. These are 90 minute sessions. And then we have a lot, you know, after each MDMA session, we talk to them, they stay overnight in the office with an attendant. We meet with them the next day for at least 90 minutes before they leave. We talk to them every day on the phone for a week, and then we meet with them you know, roughly every week, uh, or every one or two weeks um, in this study in between. So there's a lot of attention to support and integration, because as we'll talk much more about, this can really stir things up. And we, it's really important to prepare people for the fact that you know this is not about kind of a direct relationship between symptoms and getting better. 
it's more a matter of the symptoms may come in waves, they usually do, and uh, if people have more symptoms afterwards, that may be just an important part of the healing process, not that they're getting worse, but it, it's really important to prepare people for that and to be able to support them in that process. So, three people in the first study said these exact words, I don't know why they was ecstasy, which is kind of reinforcing the point I was just making. Um, it's really fun when it's just flowing and unfolding, and sometimes it's like that. You just sit back and enjoy watching it happen, but it's, it's not always like that. And, and the, the audio we're going to show you this afternoon is actually about later in the session when everything's not all sweetness and light, and things are coming up, and how, how, how do we work with that? We, have, we, do, we do the skid, the structured clinical interviews for, interview for diagnosis, but we don't do it. All of our testing is done by a psychologist who's not involved in the treatment phase. So we certainly get the history. We talk to the former uh, psychiatrist or therapist, but we do our own. Our psychologist does our own skid, and we we decide, you know, based on the skid and the history and our clinical set assessment. But, but basically, the skid is the standard. And our first, our deciding. We when we first talk to people and do the phone screening, that's a chance to try to understand what's happening for them, and then they come for their informed consent. So Michael and I get to meet people, and after they sign the informed consent, we spend some time talking before they go and see the psychologist. So we often talk to the psychologist about the things that maybe we picked up on and just get his feedback about what he thinks. And yeah, But I think you're right that they come with a lot of um, baggage of diagnoses that probably aren't true. Yeah. They can be on the medicines when they have the CATS, the clinical assisted PTSD score, and the other um, testing we do with a psychologist. And then we taper them off of those medicines before their first MBMA session. A minimum of five half-lives of whatever medicine it is, but we also we try to have another couple weeks of kind of stabilization after that. In the vet, vet study and firefighter study, we a lot of the vets are not on medicine um, because they tried them all and they really found that they weren't useful. Yeah, one of the criteria for both studies is they have to be treatment resistant. In the first study, that meant they have to have had therapy and medicines, at least SSRIs. In the current, in the vet study, they have to have had either or, because lots of vets haven't had much therapy. But they have to be off every over-the-counter medicine, um, except for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or acetaminophen or something that we've specifically approved, because we definitely don't want somebody taking, um, you know, pseudofed, pseudoephedrine or something the day before. In the first study, we excluded people with hi hypertension. And same with all the other studies, except the VET study. Now we've gotten permission to include people with, as we said, treated hypertension. So we've had a couple people on beta bloggers, and it doesn't seem to have interfered with their experience. So maybe it's more theoretical or more dose dependent, but we haven't seen a problem with that. We just leave, leave them on their, their um, hypertension medicine. And, then and then antibiotics too are okay. If they're on clonazepam, we taper them off of that and then get them on lorazepam if they're going to need something so that we can have a rescue medicine during the study if they're going to need something. We have so to be off everything for the NDMA sessions, but then we can use something like a benzodiazepine or um, zolpidem for sleep in between. We do that as sparingly as we can but sometimes people have been on a lot of medicines and they come off, it's helpful to be able to kind of help them manage the waves of anxiety as they're working with them, as long as we're not, we want to make sure we're not using that instead of continuing the process and integrate. But sometimes they can be a useful tool to help people be able to do that if they're having quite a bit of trouble afterwards. No, we don't care what the blood pressure is. Um, 
that you know the FDA requires us to measure it every 15 minutes in the first study, and um, but you know the reality is there really isn't any such thing as a hypertensive emergency in the absence of end organ symptoms. You know, so people are not having chest pain or hypertensive encephalopathy or uh, renal failure. Uh, it doesn't matter what the blood pressure is. It, it goes up. We know why it goes up. We just give them a drug with amphetamine-like qualities. And the best treatment for that is to let the drug wear off, which is what we're planning to do anyway. So um, it's, it's actually better not to know, because Annie gets nervous when I get <laughs> <laughs> um, So now, um, the reason we asked for permission to cover it up is because we want to we're trying to blind ourselves. And um, that's not the only factor, but that's one factor. If we can see the pulse and blood pressure, we can't help being influenced about what we guess in terms of dose. Um, so that's that's the reason. If we, but we have it there, and we have it, we can push a button and print out all the blood pressures. We can check it twice and look at it at the beginning, then we cover it up. And if there were some symptoms or some signs that there might be a hypertensive emergency, then we'd uncover it, we print it, and we respond accordingly. We've never had to do that yet. The only time we've had, we've never had to give anybody medical treatment during the session. We did have one person recently, one of the firefighters, who um, had uh, on his 12 lead EKG that we did initially, had one ventricular premature contraction. PVC is a S for non-medical people. That's like an extra beat, which can be a normal finding. At like something like six percent of Air Force recruits have PVCs on there if you monitor them for 24 hours. But it, but in the setting of um, cardiac ischemia, you know some cardiovascular disease. Uh, with an acute change, it can be a very significant finding, in, an increase in that. But we decided he was fine, um, and we went ahead without any further evaluation. Well, wait a minute. Let's back up a little bit. We picked it up on the blood pressure. We were doing his blood pressure. Well, I mean, at baseline, we saw it on the 12 yeah. EKG. Oh, yeah, yeah. We okay. went ahead. Yeah. But in the session, we saw his, blood, his pulse, and his pulse was jumping from like 110 to 65 the next time, 15 minutes later, and then 105 or 120 down to 55. So Michael started taking the manual pulse too, and we decided that he was having, probably having some PVCs, and this was later in the day. So the reason we were looking at the blood pressure and pulse was this is an open label session. He had had two low dose sessions, and this was his third full dose session. So I, I, I figured um, he didn't seem to be having symptoms that I thought were indicative of ischemia. Um, so I decided to wait and see if it would settle back down. He was having quite a few runs of trigeminy, meaning a PVC every third beat. Um, but he was tolerating it well. He had a good session. Um, and I decided to wait and see if they settled down. But by around 5 o'clock, seven hours after in the May administration, he was still having just as many. And he had had, you know, it can be challenging assessing symptoms, of course, because he'd had a lot of jaw pain from clenching his jaw. He'd had a lot of intense stuff happening in his chest that he interpreted as uh, releasing things, and we thought that's probably what it was. But I decided, okay, this is not going away. He's had some symptoms that could possibly be related to ischemia. He had a family history. He had a family history. His father had a bypass. So I took him to the emergency room at 5.30. So you know, the good news is it didn't really interrupt his session. It did interrupt the integration. And he had cardiac enzymes. They, they admitted him, had serial cardiac enzymes had a nuclear stress test and a cardiac echo the next day, everything was normal. So it was 
it turned out it was not a ischemia. It wasn't a problem, but I think it was still the right thing to do in that case. So that's been the first time in about 100 sessions that we've had to do anything. And it, it turned out okay. His, uh, the, the night attendant went and was with him at the hospital. She was going to be with him at the office anyway, so she went and had dinner with him and got him settled in his room. So he was okay. He was happy. He got a clean bill of health the next day. Yeah, I hung out in the ER with him for a couple hours before they took him upstairs. It did affect his integration, and we, we've um, seen him a couple times since. We're going to see him again when we get home. We have the flexibility for adding extra integration sessions, so we're going to give him an extra one. Were you an This was the second session. Were you going to make the first? Um, I think I would have. Uh, no, not with the normal tests. You know, if, if he had this, since he had the normal enzymes and nuclear stress test, um, I probably would have brought him back for a third. I would have had to talk to Julie Holland, who's our medical monitor, and make sure she agreed. So I think that you could make a reasonable call either way. I think some, some people, maybe Julie would have wanted to exclude him. But I think, um, you know, in, in retrospect, I don't know how I would have known to do anything differently, but I guess if I decided I saw that PVC and I wanted to get a stress test, and that um, we do a, a carotid ultrasound too on people with hypertension, I could have worked him up more ahead of time. If I'd had that information, I wouldn't have worried when he started having more PVCs. So another, another thing about I don't know why they call this ecstasy. Um, Michael and I don't have an agenda that we're trying to get somebody to a blissful state at the point of when the MDMA is at its peak or any of that. We just follow the process. So I think that's another point about the therapy, the therapeutic approach that we take. And we'll talk much more about that as we go along. So we'll see if this will let me change. Yeah. So these are just some of the side effects that you're probably familiar with um, on the day of the session. The ones on the left are more common with MDMA, and the ones on the right we've seen have been more common on the day of the session with inactive placebo in the first study. And then we track them for seven days. Um, the, we don't actually call them side effects at this point. We call them spontaneously reported um, reactions. reactions. Thank you. Andrew. This is the week after the session. Um, and just to give you an idea of what we've seen in terms of blood pressure, you know, processing trauma makes your blood pressure and pulse go up too, as you can see. This was inactive placebo, and these were the, um, the maximum values during the session. So, the systolic went up almost as much at maximum as placebo, and um, the diastolic went up quite a bit, but not a, with placebo, but not as much as with MDMA. Heart rate went up, you know, in the same range with both, and uh, the same thing with the temperature. We measure temperature every hour too, but that's you know I think we we're getting close to asking the FDA not to make us do that and to let us measure the blood pressure less often. Um, so why are we doing this? Why did we think this was a good idea to use MDMA for PTSD? Um, you know, since, since treating PTSD with almost all the approaches involves revisiting the trauma in a therapeutic setting, um, some of the obstacles for doing that successfully are fear, and defensiveness and lack of trust. So, you know, people with PTSD tend to have a lot of anxiety. That's one of the um, symptom areas. A lot of um, hypervigilance and um, anxiety that comes up when they revisit the trauma. And if there's too much of that, they, it, it's just the therapy doesn't work. And there's good evidence for that in other models like um, prolonged exposure. Edna Fuller calls it. Uh, over engagement. If there's too much of that, then processing the trauma doesn't work. Conversely, uh, people with PTSD also, one of their 
avoiding symptoms, which I think is going to be a separate realm in the DSM-5, um, they have a lot of inner avoidance or emotional numbing. And so if they revisit the trauma in therapy and they're numbed out, they just kind of report on it, but they make no um, emotional connection, there's good evidence that the therapy, you know, the exposure therapy or revisiting the trauma isn't helpful in that case. Well, MDMA seems to help decrease the emotional numbing. And also, I've got another slide that kind of shows you how we think about it. And also then, of course, people with PTSD often have a lot of trouble with trust. So it makes sense that if there's something that can decrease fear and defensiveness, increase connection with emotions, and increase trust, it might be helpful in overcoming the obstacles to successful treatment. Yeah, there's a fairly high level of substance abuse and dependence in, in PTSD. So quite a few people have had a history of that. Um, you know, it's a tough call whether you need how long people need to be clean and sober because, um, you know, there, there's actually a study going on at the Charleston VA now treating substance abuse and PTSD concurrently rather than the old model of you got to get the substance abuse treated before the PTSD, yet, you know, they're drinking or taking other things because of their PTSD symptoms. So. Um, we just tried to find a, a workable cutoff, um, and it seems to seems to work pretty well. Um, we don't have. Uh, I wish we had more formal data on relapse, but in general, um, people are telling us that they're having less problem with substance abuse afterwards because their PTSD is better. Um, hmm, this didn't come through with all the colors, but anyway, um, this is kind of a, a adapted from Pat Ogden, uh, kind of a uh, illustration of what we're talking about. If the kind of the vertical axis is the level of arousal, up top is hyperarousal. Um, again, really common, but one of the PTSD symptom groups. People have kind of intrusive memory, disorganized cognitive processing, they can't uh, successfully process the trauma. You might think of it as, you know, the amygdala is really going strong, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex is not really able to process it. Um, and then hypoarousal, where there's emotional numbing, people are kind of cognitive processing is kind of disabled, and they're not connecting. And so this idea it comes from other models of therapy that there's this window of tolerance or optimal arousal zone in between hyperarousal and hypoarousal, and that maybe what MDMA does give people four or five or six hours in that optimal arousal zone so they can revisit the trauma in a, in a much more helpful way, and then that gives them the template for doing that going forward. Well, but you could think of um, the their, their color rate, or, or maybe that's it too. They, it does, they get in here more easily, maybe partly because it brings them in, and partly because it brings the... Yeah, yeah, that's neat. That's right, yeah. Maybe we'll use that. We always tell people it'll come in waves, so we'll tell them it's going to be kind of like a fat snake, in case you're wondering. It seems, it seems to help with the cognitive processing. It needs to help. Right. It helps them. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, our, our research so far is not designed to figure out why this works. We're trying to see if we can demonstrate that it does work. So these are just speculations uh, that make some sense, but I'm sure the picture, you know, the explanation for why is, is much bigger and we need a lot more work on that. And then there's this other way, other way of thinking about PTSD and what happens with MDMA that kind of fits pretty well with that window of arousal. And you know, we don't yet have any data on before and after imaging with people with PTSD using MDMA. We're trying to get some of that done. But so far, we do know that um, this neuropsychiatry model uh, of PTSD, which is thought of as a deficit, 
extinction of fear conditioning. Um, and we know that uh, there's imaging studies showing that um, in people with PTSD, there's reduced volume and activity in the hippocampus, increased activity in the amygdala, and decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex, among other things. I mean, this is a very complicated picture that I don't understand, but that's kind of a simplified version. So we know that's true in PTSD, and we know there's a study from Switzerland, from Franz Bollenmutter's lab, who's also speaking next door, and they gave MDMA to, to normal volunteers, and 75 minutes after administration, they put him in a PET scanner, and that showed decreased activity in the left amygdala, increased activity in the prefrontal cortex, as well as other places. So that's pretty nice. Uh, it fits quite well with that window of tolerance idea, and it, you know, it shows that at least MDMA has some effects of the opposite of the deficits that occur with PTSD. So that all that means is we need to explore that further. But that's one other way of thinking about why MDMA might make sense for PTSD. And so, uh, as I said before, um, well, an additional therapeutic effect is that it's not, as I said, it's not definitely not all bliss. There's a lot of difficult reprocessing of uh, uh, the trauma, but people do usually at some point have some positive affirming experiences, and that's we think that's an important part of the therapy too. It's like um, we tell people, you know, if you're having fun and feeling really good, we don't think you're wasting time by not processing the trauma. <laughs> we, we encourage you to go with whatever's coming, and you know, our way of thinking of it that we really learned from Stan Groff is. It's the person's own inner healing intelligence that guides the process. And we try to follow it and support it and maybe help it get unstuck once in a while. Um, so it's great when this happens too. And the other thing is it's relaxing. A lot of people with PTSD have never had a moment of relaxation and that their body feels good. And if that happens, you're just like so happy for them, you know. Yeah. And, and they, they can really. Um, correct some cognitive distortions if you want to think of elements from other therapies, they usually have a, a really distorted view of the world and the level of safety around them and, that, and, and whether they're, they could possibly feel happy and having that experience can be very corrective also. And, and usually part of it is, is learning the blocks that keep them from getting uh, nourishment or happiness. So that, that often comes up because stuff from childhood usually comes up too, and you're, you're working with that at the same time. Quite often, I mean, we'll talk more about this as we get further into it, but quite often people revisit the trauma in great detail and, and are able to talk about it, yeah, for sure. One of the women in the first study um, really couldn't go out of her house, kept the shades drawn, slept really late. Um, had to have her husband with her to go to the grocery store, couldn't look people in the eye, couldn't really be in public. After the study, she um, got a, she got a job at Starbucks, and she got up at five every morning and went to work. She loved doing that. And one of the rules at Starbucks, we found out, is that every employee has to look the customer in the eye twice during the encounter. <laughs> and she was not only able to do that, she really enjoyed her work. So we, there are lots of examples of that, people telling us about concrete mm -hmm. changes and the avoidance going away. Yeah. Sitting in their rooms, you know, the vets sitting with weapons under their mattresses or um, by the window watching always. Yeah. Well, one veteran that recently finished had, I don't know, 30 maybe weapons, guns that he kept all around the house under his pillow, by the bed, by the front door, knives everywhere, weapons in his truck. And during the session, he realized, I'm not in that kind of danger anymore. And he took all the weapons, except for one knife that he kept in his truck, and he locked them in trunks in his attic, because he thought maybe his kids would want them sometime. So I've mentioned that, you know, that many of the elements of these other therapies come up, but 
without our direction, that they tend to come up spontaneously. So we don't tell people, okay, now it's time to read the trauma script or tell us about the trauma again. We just see what happens, and they usually spontaneously start talk, going through the trauma at, at whatever time is right for them. Um, so I don't think we need to go through the details of that. These are just some slides kind of showing the way that um, elements of other therapy come up in, in MDMA work. Do you think we need to go through these, or should we keep moving? Well, I, mean, I think we're okay with that. You want to keep going, or do you want to? You want to keep going, or do you want to go through these? Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, these are in my article in the Mass Poem, pretty much. Um, okay. Let's see what we got. Um, okay, we can. You got about ten minutes for the break, so we'll just tell you go through our first study. And it sounds like virtually everybody knows about this, but it was a double-blind placebo control. We used inactive placebo in this study, um, and they had to be treatment resistant. Um, yeah. Twenty subjects, mostly childhood sexual abuse or rape. Yeah. Um, so there were two two stages. The first was the double band blind stage where they got either MDMA or an active placebo both times <coughs> for two or three sessions. The reason it's two or three is we made some protocol adjustments along the way, but we actually when we analyzed it and published it, we although we reported on it all, we focused on the two sessions because that was our original design. Um, and then there was a crossover, what we call stage two, where people who had gotten an active placebo could <coughs> to have two or three MDMA sessions, so they kind of act as their own controls. Um, we did, as I said, careful medical screening. Everybody had lab work, EKG, physical exam, psychological testing, uh, and they tapered off their, their medicines. Sometimes the tapering was very uh, was pretty challenging. In the first day, we had one person who actually who was from the West Coast, and she was in, her psychiatrist admitted her to the hospital to taper her off the benzos. So that was quite a long process. So um, that can be challenging. That, yeah. was, that was one person, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and we had we had a number of people that tapered off medicines, but. They really weren't having very good results from the medicines in the first place. No. We haven't had anybody who was that high before. We didn't have many people with a addiction to active substance abuse. No. A lot of people had history. History, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And of course, this is a selected population because <coughs> some people wouldn't end up enrolling because they didn't want to get, they thought they couldn't get off their medicines or their psychiatrist thought they couldn't get off their medicines. Um, usually they decide to do it anyway in that case, but sometimes they didn't. You know, they, recently they talked to their psychiatrist, he or she would think it wasn't a good idea, so they wouldn't do it. So some of those people have been weeded out. Um, but, you know, more often than not, people would tell us, well, these medicines aren't helping that much, and they're not making me feel very good, and I'm actually glad to have a chance to try getting off. And, but, the, but sometimes other, people had trouble with her. Yeah. So the other thing is, is it took four years to recruit 20 subjects. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, <coughs> we had a hard time recruiting people from locally. Um, we had a few psychologists that referred. We never got a referral from a psychiatrist. Um, we had people from all over the country. MAPS paid for people to fly to Charleston and to stay in hotels. So, you know, at least half of the people were coming from out of town and staying in a hotel without their support system. Uh, what was the length of duration of PTSD? 19, uh, between 19 and 20 years, uh, just under 20 years is how the average duration of PTSD in that first role. In the first, the first study. study. And people mm -hmm. were generally at the end of their rope. They thought this, if they didn't get help, they didn't know what they were gonna do. Yeah, the recruiting situation has really changed. When I last checked, we had we had gotten calls from 398 veterans, 
and it's probably, I'm sure it's over 400. That was like two weeks ago. Um, so we're not having to recruit this time. The word is out and the need is great and people are calling us. I think in the Boulder study, which hasn't started yet, they have something like 130 or so people have called them. Marcel is going to be reporting on that. So it's a much different story, but we were surprised how hard it was to recruit the first, for the first study. We had people that had had problems with alcohol abuse and we did, no, before. We did our best to make sure they were in a reasonably stable remission. We never had anybody with a problem. We did urine drug screens before each session. We never had a positive screen. We weren't able to use, they had to be off Lazepam and all other benzos before the first, before each session, each MDMA session. But um, if they were having waves with a lot of anxiety and they were having trouble managing that or had to go to work um, or having trouble sleeping, um, you know, we would encourage them to use non-drug methods as much as possible, but we kind of looked at those drugs as a way to help them, you know, integration involves working with the waves of emotion and working with whatever continues to unfold over time as much as you can, and then also figuring out how to set it aside and go on with your life and rest and do what you need to do. You know, we, we often tell people about um, the model, I, I was in um, uh, Peru once with Shipibo shaman, and, and they have a tradition in that culture that when someone does inner work like this, they go to live in a little hut at the edge of the village and they're not allowed to talk or work and people bring them food every day and the integration is built into the culture. We encourage people to take as much time as they can after the session, but often we often do the sessions on Friday and get them on Saturday and then they've got to go back to work on Monday. So we talk to them about making as much space as possible to just let the process unfold, keep in touch with us to support them, and make space for it. And at the same time, figure out how to manage that as best as we can. And so we look at the benzos sometimes as a tool. People can do it, we always teach people uh, diaphragmatic breathing or talking about ways to manage anxiety and we always encourage them to do that first but sometimes the benzos are a useful tool if it's used with that mindset. Did you use uh, lorazepam throughout the session itself? No, never never during the session. This is we're talking about afterwards. Sometimes that night sleep or if there's anxiety coming that night and then in the days after the session. Um, the only time we ever used the benzo before the session was really over was one person in this study who got, turned out to have gotten low dose, 30 milligrams of MDMA, followed by 15. And she was having such a hard time with the low dose that despite all our efforts to help her engage with what was happening, after several hours of insisting that she just wanted to take some clonazepam and have it over with. We finally, it was about, I just think, between four and five hours after administration, um, we finally gave the clonazepam. But that's the only time in, in about 100 sessions that we, we really try to stay away from using it during the session. And again, that was with low dose, where it seemed to be activating but not really helping her. So our whole model, yeah. So our whole model is that we, we encourage people to stay with and work with and support them in, in processing, feeling, and expressing the emotions rather than trying to shut them down with, with drugs. So anyway, in a nutshell, uh, as I guess you, most of you have seen, we had good results. The CAP score, which is our primary outcome measure of PTSD symptoms, is on the vertical axis. The time points are number one is baseline, number two is um, three to five days after the first MDMA session or placebo session, time point three is four to five days, three to five days after the second MDMA or placebo session, and 
going forward is two months after the last NDMA or placebo session. So you can see uh, both groups. The blue is a placebo, inactive placebo, or really should be therapy only because they got all the same therapy, all the same all-day sessions, exactly the same therapy. Um, and so actually the, the blue line, the placebo people had, a, that was actually a statistically significant improvement in caps, but still around 60. 50 was the cutoff for study entry, which means at least moderately severe PTSD. And then as you can see, the orange line, the NDMA group, had a very robust change. It's, you know, the average change was just over 20 in placebo and over 50 in the NDMA group. So there was about a 33 point spread in the caps, which is very significant. Just not to compare studies, but to give you a feel for the, what that means is in the Zoloft, the sertraline trials that led to FDA indication for PTSD the difference between Zoloft and placebo was just under seven points. <laughs> and that led to FDA approval. Here we have 33 point difference. Well, uh, our impression was that um, for some people, one or two sessions was enough, but for other people, um, the third session seemed important. Also, uh, it's the idea that if you have only two sessions, every session is either the first session or the last session. And there's a lot of dynamics involved with that. You know, sometimes the first session, it really takes them that session to, like a couple of people in the first study said, now I have a map of the battlefield. And now I have a map of, I know there's a trail. Before it was just confusion. Now I see where I need to go. And I think in the next session, I'll be able to go there more fully. And then, in fact, that often is what happened. And so we've had a lot of discussion about two versus three sessions. Um, we think that um, three sessions is clinically, our clinical impression is that three sessions is useful. I mean, this is still a very small number of sessions when you consider the chronic PTSD of this magnitude. Uh, so it's striking that we're even having this conversation. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the good news. So we don't really know. Um, our, our sense is that the third session is probably really helpful for some people. And we've had a, a few people who you know, probably needed more. There's been one veteran in this study who first got low dose, three low dose sessions didn't get any better. Then she got three full dose sessions. And um, you know, she said to us afterwards, this has been really helpful, but I feel as if you've taken me two thirds or three quarters of the way up a river in a speedboat and left me off on the bank. Mm -hmm. And so it was very painful actually not to be able to offer her more sessions, yeah. but we just couldn't do it. I mean, the CAPS is a very useful instrument. It's the gold standard. It's what the FDA needs. But it certainly doesn't tell the whole story, either in terms of benefits or in terms of ongoing challenges. And maybe cementing what, what they've learned, they're learning. And I mean, it, opened, it certainly drops the symptoms, but there's a lot that gets opened up, too, about their life. Yeah. We might not see that the, right. the lasting if we stopped at one session. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you have any data on, that's, that's actually a good Do you have any data on the difference in um, persistence of effects between people who received two sessions versus three? Like when you did your follow-up, you had everybody at that point received three? No. We only had nine people that received three. So we do have some data, but it's probably not enough to really draw a conclusion about that. We are doing studies with just two sessions. I'm sorry? We are starting, we just started another study that has just two sessions. Yeah. So we will have more data. So we're actively discussing that question because it would obviously save a lot of money in phase three trials and do two <coughs> rather than three. So I think these are very pertinent questions. We just don't know the answer yet. Okay, Ken. So if I hear you correctly that all the subjects were treatment resistant? Yes. Right. And uh, one other quick question. Uh, no association between dosage and body weight? Yeah. No. Fixed dose. 
On the first okay. night? Yeah. Do you have any studies with longer follow-up? Yes, I'll show you that. Okay, maybe should we, maybe we can go, if we can just quickly go through the rest of this first study results, and then we'll take a break. So maybe hold the discussion for a minute, and we'll just show you quickly. Um, Um, so, and here's the crossover, just briefly. On the left is the baseline. These are the seven people. Eight people got therapy only. Seven of the eight collected to go into the crossover. One person had a very strong effect from just therapy only, and she decided not to. Um, so at the end of all the therapy only, their CAP score was 65, and then two months after their two MDMA sessions, it was down to 33. So in those people, we had a similar 30-point drop um, compared to placebo. Um, we also did neuro, neurocognitive testing to look at that issue about memory problems and things, and I'll just be brief. This is the most comprehensive of those tests. The others were like this. You can see MDMA on the left, baseline in purple, after two MDMA sessions in gray, same thing on the right with placebo, no evidence at all of neuropsychiatric problems with MDMA compared to placebo or before and after MDMA. Then <coughs> um, here's a long-term follow-up we did one year or more later. It ended up being an average of about three and a half years. We repeated the caps and the impact of that scale. We also gave people a questionnaire that we had designed um, they all participated in the questionnaire, but only 17 completed the CAPS. Um, so here's what we found. Of the 17 that completed the CAPS, 82% um, did no longer met criteria for PTSD. And, um, but if you, um, you know, assume that maybe those three that didn't do the CAPS had also relapsed, Although they didn't indicate on the questionnaires that that was the case, the questionnaire was not a validated instrument. So being conservative, you could say that um, of the, um, well, well, I'm getting ahead of my slides, but um, two of the people uh, who took the CAPS had a relapse of great, to greater than 50 in the PTSD symptoms, and one had it, um, met criteria and had it the caps of about 30. Um, they all said they benefited on the questionnaire. None said they were harmed. But here's the data. On the, the left hand is baseline in the original study. The baseline caps of these seven people was about 80. Two months, the middle line is two months after their um, last MDMA session. And the right hand line is three and a half years later. Hmm. So the mean cap score was was unchanged, and that includes the people that, the two people that relapsed to greater than 50. So for most people, this remission and symptoms was durable, but not for a couple of people. So, um, and this is a Swiss study that Peter Owen's going to talk about. Um, it was a small number, so they didn't actually reach statistical significance with the caps, although they did with the uh, post-traumatic diagnostic scale, but their effect size was about one, which is similar to ours, which is 1.2. So that's also promising data. Um, let's stop there. Yeah, let's stop there. Take a break.